dog got her. Bark, 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 bark. Every single show in existence has a pilot episode. There has to be a beginning somewhere. And the pilot is the testing grounds for a network to see if a show is popular enough to give the green light for a full production. Often it's just the first official episode in the series, but for a few shows that we know today, there actually exists alternate versions of their pilot episodes that are lost or partially lost. So today, we're going over 10 lost or missing pilots from popular kid shows. The Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog In the early 90s, two separate Sonic the Hedgehog cartoons were released. One regarded as good, and the other as not so much. As you might suspect, we're going to be looking at the one that's not so good. The Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog was the more comedic and wacky of the two shows, while the other was more serious and adventurous. Adventures was only able to last for one season with a total of 65 episodes. However, in 1992, a full year before the series aired, a pilot was produced in order to sell the show. Unlike the full series, this pilot was produced in-house in America, rather than being outsourced to Asia. This resulted in the pilot featuring better quality animation than the final version. Since the pilot was only meant to be used for pitching purposes, it was never released to the public, and to this day it remains mostly lost. Mostly because a bit of it actually appears in the official series. In the episode Untouchable Sonic, the two robots Scratch and Grounder can be seen watching a clip of the pilot on TV. Additionally, a clip of Dr. Robotnik being smashed on the head by an anvil from the pilot is featured in the end credits of the show. A few clips of the pilot have also made their way into a few commercials, one being a 1994 commercial for Fox 39 Kids Club, and the other being a 2008 commercial for the DS title, Sonic Chronicles The Dark Brotherhood. The world of Sonic is much broader and richer than most people realize. I mean, there's a lot of folks that are, of course, fans of the comics and TV shows, and they know that, you know, there's a lot there. So it was a great chance for us, actually, to look at this huge, huge bunch of stuff and pick really... In March of 2009, a seven-minute version of the full pilot was uploaded to YouTube with permission of animator and storyboarder Milton Knight. The crazed tyrant Dr. Robotnik is out to conquer the planet Mobius. All that stands in his way is the fastest freedom fighter who ever lived, Sonic the Hedgehog. Fine, grand. What a tightwad. It'll take more zeros to catch these heroes, eh, tail? That's right. The first one who captures the sneaky pest can name his own reward. Hooray! 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 I want that hedgehog! There is no music or sound effects, and there is a time code throughout the video, indicating that this might be a rough cut of the final version. Jaleel White, the voice of Sonic in the series, does appear to play him in the pilot, however Dr. Robotnik and Scratch are voiced by legendary voice actor Jim Cummings, as well as Tails being voiced by a different, unknown actor. Thomas the Tank Engine You'd be hard pressed to find anyone who has never seen or heard of Thomas the Tank Engine. The friendly train has been chugging along non-stop since his first book appearance in 1946, to this day where he still remains a huge icon thanks to his ongoing TV show. The series premiered in 1984, however there are reports of a lost pilot being produced at some point in the early 80s, the exact year being unknown. This test pilot would eventually become the basis for the 25th episode, titled Down the Mine. According to editor Michael Dixon, this test pilot was nothing like the final episode, featuring much fewer characters, smaller sets, and flatter lighting. No footage of this pilot has been released, with the exception being a single shot that aired in the final version, as well as a single image of Gordon. A few differences can be seen immediately in Thomas' model. His design appears to be much more simplistic than the model used in the final version. The standalone image of Gordon was shown off in an interview by Sardar Island Fansite, and showed off a similar simplistic design. It was stated that this original model of Gordon was revamped for use as a standby model in the second season, but it was eventually dismantled instead, and used as engine set dressing. Ned's Declassified School Survival Guide In 2003 and 2004, Two test pilots were created for a show that would eventually become Ned's Declassified School Survival Guide. Initially known as Ned's Classified School Survival Guide, it aired on September 7, 2003 as a special on Nickelodeon. The cast was pretty much the same, except for the character of Cookie, who was instead named Boogie, and was played by Stephen McCarrion. McCarrion would later be recast in the full series as Albert Warmenheimer, a geeky student who often picks his nose. The character was changed to Cookie and given to Daniel Curtis Lee in an effort to show racial diversity in the show. The pilot was pretty successful, 
and has not aired again since its initial broadcast in 2003. Then, a second pilot was made in 2004, titled Ned's Locker. However, there is no information whatsoever about this second episode, other than the fact that it exists. The full series of Ned's Declassified ran from 2004 to 2007. There was even talks about a sequel series about the characters going through high school, with Ned's actor Devin Werkheiser signing a development contract with Nickelodeon for it. However, the show was never greenlit, due to the other actors being too busy with their own projects. Speaking of Werkheiser, he was on Reddit two years ago and was asked by a user if he had a copy of the original pilot series. Unfortunately, he claimed that he had no idea where that would be. A Hundred and One Dalmatians, the series. Disney has quite the history with turning their films into TV shows, like Lilo and Stitch, the series, Tangled, the series, and Big Hero 6, the series. Disney has no shortage of films to draw from on the television side of things, so for this entry, we'll be taking a look at one of their often forgotten attempts at adapting a film to TV, A Hundred and One Dalmatians, the series. ABC Saturday mornings are going to the dogs. We can do it. We can do anything. This September, Disney presents an all-new animated series starring America's favorite puppies. This is very good. It's 101 Dalmatians. Love it. The show takes place in a separate continuity than the original film, as evidenced by the fact that all the main characters, aside from Cruella de Vil, have American accents. And it's not really stated if it takes place in London like in the original film. In addition, the film is more realistic and is set in the 60s, whereas the show is more cartoonish and takes place in the 90s. However, due to its more cartoonish nature, many have said that it is actually closer to the original books than the film is. In 1996, a live-action 101 Dalmatians film was being developed, and Disney wanted a tie-in series to be released shortly after. Two test demos were pitched to Disney, one for 101 Dalmatians and one for Recess. While Recess looked very different from the final product, 101 Dalmatians was more in line with the final style of the show. However, the pilot for Recess was eventually remade as an official episode, whereas the pilot for 101 Dalmatians was not. Not much is known about this pilot, as the only clips that were shown were in sneak peeks on ABC Saturday mornings and as promos on the VHS releases of the live-action film and Doug's Birthday Blues. One interesting tidbit that we can see in these clips is an artist drawing a removed character named Penny. Nothing is known about this character, but her design seems more detailed than the other characters, and may indicate that there were plans to have the series feature an art style closer to the original film at one point. The Powerpuff Girls The Powerpuff Girls have a bit of interesting history when it comes to the period of time before the show was officially released. For instance, did you know that the original working title for the show was going to be The Whoopass Girls? Sugar, spice, and everything nice. These were the ingredients chosen to create the perfect little girl. But Professor Utonium accidentally added a can of Whoopass to the concoction. The original Powerpuff Girls short was titled Whoopass Stew, A Sticky Situation, and was made by Craig McCracken while he was still at CalArts. Once he sent it to Cartoon Network, the title was of course changed to make it a bit more kid-friendly. So there you have it, a little bit of interesting history for you, but for this entry, we'll be looking at the 2016 reboot of the Powerpuff Girls. There is very, very, very little known about their pilot episode. It is thought to have been developed shortly after the release of the CGI special Dance Pants Sid however you pronounce that, released in 2014. As Cartoon Network has been considering reviving the series for quite a while, if you're familiar at all with the reception, then you're aware that one of the biggest criticisms is the use of different voice actors for Blossom, Buttercup, and Bubbles, even though Tom Kenny and Roger L. Jackson were brought back as the mayor and Mojo Jojo respectively. However, if this pilot does exist, then it appears that Cartoon Network did consider using the original voice actors at one point. During an interview with the media site Otakus and Geeks, E.G. Daily, the voice of Buttercup, discussed the existence of this pilot. This is the first and only time its existence has been mentioned. She explained that herself, Tara Strong, and Kathy Cavadini recorded a pilot episode of the series, the 2016 one, with different currently unknown showrunners. However, when the current showrunners Nick Jennings and Bob Boyle were brought on board, they decided to replace the original voice actresses with new voices that were closer in age to the characters they were playing. 
There were many rumors circulating that Daily Strong and Cavadini were never contacted about the series, but it would appear that those claims are false. Back at the Barnyard In 2006, Nickelodeon and Paramount Studios released their second all-CGI film, the first being Jimmy Neutron Boy Genius, in the form of Barnyard. Much like Jimmy Neutron, Barnyard was not based on any pre-existing franchise, and was instead somewhat of a test pitch to see how the audience would react to a full series. They didn't really like the film, as it currently sits on 22% on Rotten Tomatoes, with the general consensus being that it's unimaginative, unfunny, and utterly creepy. Get it? Despite the negative reception to the film, it was given a spin-off series titled Back at the Barnyard. This featured largely the same cast, with the exception of the main character Otis, who was voiced by Kevin James in the film, now being voiced by Chris Hardwick in the series. Anyways, while the film was sort of a test pitch for the public, it turns out that there was a second one produced a full six years before the film was released, back in 2000. The pitch was made by DNA Productions, known for their work on Jimmy Neutron and that monkey that always introduces himself as Paul. The tagline for the series was, What do animals do when the humans aren't watching? The animation, as expected, is of much lower quality, with the characters moving in very stilted and unnatural ways. And for a long time, it was rumored that this was an unaired pilot for the series, but in a tweet by the show director Todd Grimes, it was revealed that this was indeed just a test pitch, and was never meant to be seen by the public. Despite that, some footage of the pitch was released in a short teaser in 2005, meant to promote the film and TV series. Dora the Explorer In 2000, Nickelodeon unleashed one of their biggest cash cows in history, Dora the Explorer. It's one of the longest running Nick Jr. shows in history with 15 years under its belt. Anyways, while Dora the Explorer initially aired in 2000, two honored pilot episodes were made to sell the show in 1999. One was a simple test pilot, and the other was referred to as Pilot Episode. The latter of the two was completely lost. The lost pilot followed Dora and Boots on their journey to a giant cupcake with many familiar faces from the full series appearing, such as Backpack, Swiper, and The Map. Dora and Boots also had different designs, with Dora having a different clothing color scheme, and Boots' color scheme being slightly different as well. The test pilot, however, has been somewhat found, although the audio is still completely lost. It features Dora in her final design, but Boots looks completely different, being much more fluffy and having a yellow color scheme. The clip features a rather stilted animation of Dora and Boots walking, and just staring at the screen. It's honestly a little unnerving. Snorks In 1977, a Belgian businessman by the name of Freddy Monikendam negotiated a contract between NBC, Hanna-Barbera, and an artist named Peyo, the creator of the Smurfs. This contract was pretty much about the creation of a Smurfs TV series, the very same one that we know of today. Peyo wanted the cartoon to be as faithful to the comics as possible, but Monikendam wanted a more mainstream approach to the marketing. This resulted in many arguments, and eventually a legal dispute between the two of them, due to the rights and money involved. After failing to acquire the rights to the Smurfs, Monikendam searched for a new brand that could rival their success, and found what he was looking for with the Belgian cartoonist, Nick Braca, with his project The Snorks. Monikendam bought the rights, and they went into production with Hanna-Barbera to turn the Snorks into the next big worldwide phenomena. Or so they had hoped. It turns out that the Snorks just weren't popular enough with the audiences, leading the show to last only five years. Was it because it was too similar to the Smurfs? Was it because it looked like they had dicks on their heads? Who knows? What we do know, however, is that an initial pilot for the series was created by NBC before the series went into production and is mostly lost to this day. The pilot was only three minutes long and featured two unnamed Snorks who never made it to the final show. Other than that, there's not much else known. Only a few clips of it have ever been seen, when it was featured in a promotional spot during the NBC Saturday Morning Kids block, appearing alongside other shows like Alvin and the Chipmunks. Given the age of this pitch compared to the other ones on this list, it's very likely that this one will remain lost. Drake and Josh in 2004, Nickelodeon released their hit show Drake and Josh. This was third in their long line of live action shows that sort of spun off from the previous show, with Drake Bell and Josh Peck initially appearing in the Amanda show beforehand, alongside a few other actors. The trend continued, with Miranda Cosgrove going from Drake and Josh to iCurly, 
and then Jeanette McCurdy going from iCarly to Sam and Cat. In 2003, a pilot was made for the show before Nickelodeon officially greenlit production and featured a few glaring differences from the final product. The plot is basically the same as the first episode. Drake and Josh's parents get married, and then they all move in together. Drake eventually learns that Josh writes an advice column called Miss Nancy, where he must dress up as a woman in order to actually be able to write. Perhaps the biggest difference is that Drake and Josh's father, Walter Nichols, is played by a completely different actor instead of Jonathan Goldstein. The identity of the actor is unknown, and he looks to be much older than Goldstein. In addition, the set of the living room is completely different from the final product, although the other sets appear to look the same as their final versions. A few other differences are Drake's hair being styled a bit differently and the Miss Nancy outfit. The existence of the pilot was unknown until 2013, when creator Dan Schneider posted some screenshots of it onto his Twitter account. The entire pilot was on YouTube, but the video has been privatized and is no longer available to the public. Josh Nichols. I'm Josh Peck, and I play Josh Nichols. He's very loving and like a good guy, but he's really geeky and kind of trips himself up. He's not like really concerned about what other people think. He just does what's fun for him and what makes him happy. I am Miss Dancer. His goofiness kind of works for him. What happened? Snake! <laughs> Other than the few short clips that are included in the promo, there is no other information available on the pilot, and neither Nickelodeon or Dan Schneider have released any sort of comment on it, or even really acknowledged its existence. It's theorized that the shot of the two playing tennis in the opening credits originates from the lost pilot. Blue's Clues for many children born in the 90s, Blue's Clues was one of the first TV shows they were exposed to. The program was revolutionary, as it presented its educational content in a more narrative format, as opposed to the magazine style presented by many children's shows before it. With this being a new, unexplored format in early childhood television, Blue's Clues naturally spent many years in development, before it was released to the public. The show officially aired in 1996, but the initial pilot was actually meant to be released a year before, in 1995. The show was initially titled Blue's Prince, probably changed to Blue's Clues because it just rolls off the tongue better, and was only shown to a small test group of preschoolers. According to several reports, the preschoolers just ate it up, and the potential of the series was almost immediately realized. However, there were a few major changes made to the show. For starters, Blue was initially going to be a male cat named Mr. Orange, which begs the question, why was it called Blue's Prince? Well, then they later changed it to Mr. Blue, and then eventually to just Blue, the dog we know today. A few smaller details were changed as well, such as Mr. Saw initially having a Brooklyn accent before it was changed to French. Here's the secret behind the saying that Mr. Saw was originally not French. Ooh. The original Mr. Saw sound is something like that. And Steve having a red shirt instead of his trademark green striped shirt. A test audience of kids made the final casting call. Can you help me today? Yeah. What did you say? Yeah. Young Steve Burns would be their boy. After the show was released, the original pilot was never shown again, nor was it talked about until 10 years later in 2006, when Nickelodeon released a 10 year anniversary special that went over the history of the series. A few brief clips of Blue's Prince were shown, while crew members talked over them and relayed their experience with it. Unfortunately, this is the only footage of the pilot we have available. When asked if the full pilot would be released, Nickelodeon stated that it was unlikely, as they felt it was far too different from the rest of the series. 